for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Tuesday morning, July the 2nd, 1985. Summer Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Brother Norman Parrish of Guatemala comes to speak. Praise the Lord. How many are happy in Jesus this morning? God has been doing a deep and lasting work in the lives of many of those that are in camp this summer. I'm sure you all came here not out of a ha sense of habit, but a sense of need. No matter how much we have grown, no matter how much we have advanced, there's still much territory to be covered and conquered as we come into the fullness of the Spirit of God. It's a joy to be here. I've really been looking forward to these series of meetings. As you perhaps already know, I, I enjoy coming to Lake Hamilton. I've been here once or twice a year in the last... Uh, Several years, I've learned to love, appreciate, respect Brother Glenn, Sister Irma. They're very precious to us. We consider them our friends, our backers, our supporters. It's wonderful to be with them and with all of you. Now, I've been invited to share. I've been invited to minister this morning. And as I, when I got up a little bit before uh, dawn, I asked the Lord to give me something to bring to your attention something that might bless you, something that might inspire you, something that might challenge you. And the Lord led me to Psalm 107. This is a psalm of deliverance, a psalm of deliverance. Anybody that's interested in deliverance should study the book of Psalms. There's a wealth of material about spiritual warfare and about spiritual deliverance in the book of Psalms. It's one of the sections of the Bible that you should study thoroughly if you want to be effective in deliverance ministry. Psalm 107. We're going to read... Uh, we start off just verse, verse number two. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now this is an order. This is a command. God by his spirit is saying, let those who have experienced God's deliverance power or redeeming power say so. It's talking about sharing it. It's talking about confessing. It's talking about witnessing. Uh, we who have experienced what God can do in our lives, redeeming us from the hand of the enemy, have an obligation. We are supposed to let others know what God can do for them. Um, I've discovered down through the years, brethren, that a lot of people that have been delivered from demon powers are ashamed to even admit it. And when they get up in church to give a testimony, they kind of just uh, skim over it. They don't go into any kind of detail or any kind of description. And they're, they're too afraid or too ashamed to say what truly has happened to them. And this is a disservice because they don't know what harm they're ca doing. And because there are other people in that congregation that might look very nice and neat on the surface that are just staff full of demons that need someone to encourage them uh, to seek for help and for deliverance. But if you who have been delivered are not willing or able or ready to tell others what God has done for you, then what hope do we have for the church? And what hope do we have for the world? See, a testimony will awaken within other people the desire to take whatever steps are needed to enter into a life of liberty in Jesus Christ. Now, this is an order. It's, a, it's, it's really a, a, a scriptural commandment that you should not disregard, that you should not disobey. Let the redeemed, the redeemed of the Lord, say so. Say so. That means say that it is so, that God is able to set free even those that are bound and afflicted by evil spirits. Now, in this, uh, in this psalm, there are four there are four tableaus. There are four descriptions of four different men that came under the hand of the enemy. You know, the enemy works in different people different ways. Uh, the enemy's work in your life is quite different than the work of the enemy in uh, your neighbor's life. The enemy is a master tactician. He's got all kinds of methods, all kinds of means that he can use to bring you into bondage. And so we should not compare our experience or judge our experience by anyone else. Uh, we should realize that we're unique in individuals and that God is going to 
Satan is going to manifest himself in a different way in our lives, and God's going to operate in a different way in our lives. Uh, some people are disappointed when their deliverance is not as spectacular as someone else's. What's wrong with me? I didn't foam at the mouth. I didn't wall on, on, on the ground. I didn't shake and quake. I didn't scream. I didn't carry on in a, in a seeming manner. What's wrong with me? <laughs> Trying to get rid of me? No, that, oh, I've got it here. I didn't even notice when he put it on me. <laughs> That's... Oh, Lord. You know, some people uh, try, uh, are disappointed when they don't have those violent, spectacular manifestations that sometimes are seen in delivering service. But see, we're all different. Uh, some people are very emotional, some others aren't. Some people are very uh, uh, exterior, ex exteriorize their emotions, and they just fly off the handle. And uh, But others are so calm and so, uh, so sedate that, that they're not, uh, the evil spirits don't, do not manifest in or through them in the way that they do in others. Now let's study these four scenes, because here we see the way that the enemy works in our lives to bring us into defeat. Now the first scene can be found from verse 4 through verse 9. I'm going to read it. It says, They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul faded in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in the trouble, and he delivered them. There's the word deliverance. Delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. All that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Now here we see the picture of a man that is wandering aimlessly in a desert or in a wilderness. He has lost his sense of direction. He's wandering without being able to come to uh, his destination. He's befuddled. He's confused. He cannot find direction for his life. And brethren, uh, I've found many born-again Christians and many spiritual Christians that have no direction for their life. They have not set any goals. They're not aiming in any specific generation, they're just drifting, uh, direct, I mean, they're just drifting through life. They're wasting their time and, and talent because they're, they have nothing that they are actually living for. Their life is a waste. Now the Bible says here that people that are wandering through life are very unhappy. Uh, the word, the, there's a word here, solitary. They feel alone and they feel aloof from other people. Uh, they have withdrawn, and they're isolated from the rest of, of humanity. And this is the work of the devil. The devil wants to get us off by ourselves, where we're just wandering aimlessly without any guidance from God. We're not striving to reach any kind of destination, spiritually or otherwise. The Bible says that here that they were hungry and they were thirsty. That means that there was an emptiness in their soul. They couldn't find anything that would bring satisfaction, or a sense of fulfillment, or a sense of happiness. Now I wonder how many of us today have fallen into this kind of a trap. This is the work of the enemy. God needs to redeem us out of a, of a life like this. You know, it's a senseless, senseless life. Brother, there's so many Christians today that, that are in this condition. It is because they have permitted the enemy to invade their souls. The Bible says here that their soul fainted. Uh, that means that there's, a, there's a, they, they've fallen into a discouragement, into despondency, into despair. Now, how many people today here at Lake Hamilton would have to confess to the fact that their life is meaningless too? We're just drifting, we're just wandering. We have nothing we are trying to achieve in this life. I don't think this is the will of God for us. Uh, God has set before us some lofty goals, uh, Christ-likeness. God wants to reproduce the image of his Son in us, the character of his Son in us, the ministry of his Son in us. He wants us to be like Christ in every detail of our life. He wants us to strive towards perfection. He wants us to strive towards immortality. He wants us to desire with all our heart to be a part of that first fruit company, that man-child company. He wants us to become sons of God in every aspect of our life. 
But some of us, month after month, year after year, are just drifting. That's the work of the enemy. And anybody that's fallen into this trap needs what? Deliverance. Because it's the enemy that's blocking you. It's the enemy that's befuddling you. It's the enemy that has such a hold upon your life that you just cannot even hear from God. Some people have told me, I, I just have an awful time hearing from God. I don't know how, I don't know how to get direction for my life. Now the Bible says that the Spirit of God will lead us into all truth. Not only as it pertains to doctrine, but to practical living. But how sad it is, then, in spite of the fact that many of us have the Holy Spirit since our regeneration and since our baptism, yet the Spirit of God is not able, as much as he wants to, he's not able to guide us, to direct us in the right path. Now, anybody that is in this condition should examine his life and say, Lord, what are the, the, the spirits that are influencing me so that I'm not able to come to my desired destination? Are you living in a desert? Are you living in that awful wilderness, a wilderness filled with serpents and with scorpions, a parched land, barren, dry, waste. Is that your life? Well, brethren, that would prove unmistakably that you need deliverance. The Lord wants to deliver you. He's provided all the necessary resources so that you can be delivered. But he's waiting for you to take the initiative. The Bible says here in verse uh, 9, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. If you, if you have no direction for your life, you're in deep trouble. Huh? There's nothing so sad than to be drifting through life without knowing what I'm doing, where I'm going. Trouble. And if you're in this kind of trouble, you need to cry out unto the Lord. There, in that verse, we can find an adverb. And it's an adverb of time. Then they cried unto the Lord. Why do we have to wait till we're lost? Why do we have to wait till we, we feel uh, completely dissatisfied with our Christian experience to cry out to the Lord. This word cry means to cry with a loud voice. It means to cry in anguish. It means to cry in despair. Uh, you, you have to put your, your soul behind it. If you read the book of Exodus, you'll find, brethren, that when the people of Israel were being browbeaten, they were oppressed, they were bound, they had governors, they had taskmasters over them that made their life miserable. It says they cried out to God. And this is the kind of cry that God's is waiting from us. Uh, not just that little prayer that sometimes we utter uh, when we ask God for a purpose in life and for a direction in life. No. We need to cry out to God loudly. And then he'll intervene. Amen? As the Bible says here, he, and then they cried out, he cried unto the Lord in the trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. Yes, God wants to deliver out, you out of your trouble, out of your affliction, out of your distress. He wants to give you a definite direction in life. Uh, whether you're young or middle-aged or uh, old, excuse me for using that word, uh, no matter what age, uh, you need direction for your life. Amen? Because I... I think, brethren, uh, in one of the saddest things that can happen to you is to come to the end of your life and look back and say, it's been a waste. I've achieved nothing. I've gained nothing. I have nothing to show for my life. Uh, that's true of anybody that seeks only material pursuits and intellectual pursuits. Because all of that will be left behind. All of that will be eventually lost. I remember my dad telling me when he decided to go to the mission field, he was saved and called to the mission field. He was the only Christian in his family. All the others were professing Christians. They were good church people. They were good moral people. But when he went and told his brothers that he was going to the mission field, they said, you're crazy, absolutely crazy. His dad was a prosperous businessman in the city of Toronto, Canada. He had several real estate offices. And he, 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 he sold everything. He left everything to go to the mission field. And his brother said, Norman, in a few years you'll become, you'll sneak back to Canada on your knees and you're going to come and beg us to take you in, to give you a fresh start in life. And they, for years and years, they, they scoffed and they scorned at his decision to go to the mission field. But you know, uh, towards the end of his life, many of his brothers became ill and infirm. He went to visit them and one day his closest brother, his youngest brother, said to him, Norman, you're, 
We said you were the fool, but we have discovered that we were the fool. Because hmm? here I, I worked like a dog. I worked my head off to, to improve this farm, uh, to, to make this farm productive. Uh, I've spent years and years and years accumulating wealth, and now I'm ready to face my maker, and I have nothing to show for it. That's true of anybody that is just drifting through life. Hmm? Are you living for intellectual pursuit, for material pursuit? Uh, your life will be meaningless. You'll feel a uh, solitude. You'll feel an emptiness. You'll feel that you wasted your life. That's why you need deliverance, so that you can be keenly attuned to God, so that God can get to you with, and direct you and show you what you're supposed to do with your life in the years to come. See, when we get around 50 or 60, the enemy begins to tell us that we're the best part of our life is over, <laughs> that there's nothing that we can do, huh? that, we're, that we're, uh, we're useless, that we're going to be a drag and we're going to be a burden to other people. That's not true. Let me tell you, I'm 53 and I feel my best years are ahead of me. The Lord's blessed me and used me in, in unsuspected ways, but I think that <laughs> this is little in comparison with what's going to happen through my ministry in Latin America in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I have the patience today that I didn't have before. I have the wisdom today that I didn't have before. I have the courage today that I didn't have before. And as long as I have good health and I have good, uh, I believe that God can use me in ways that I never suspected before. Amen. And if that's true for me, it's true for you. But what you need to do is to come out of that wilderness that you've been living in, that waste land, where you've just been drifting without a compass. Uh, seeking here and seeking there for something that will satisfy and fill your longing. Brethren, the answer is in Jesus Christ. And he can redeem you. And he can release you. And he can deliver you out of that condition. Amen? Amen. Deliver you out of that your distress. I'm sure, brethren, many times when you're alone, you feel distraught. Uh, because you, you examine yourself. And you wonder what you've done with yourself. What have you done with your talent? What you've done with your ability? And you ask yourself, has my life meant anything to anybody but myself? Well, brethren, there's a ministry open before you. And you know what that ministry is called? Deliverance. I have another message I'm think I think probably I'll preach in uh, during this camp meeting. It's called None to Deliver. It talks about the need for deliverance ministers. The great scarcity, the great dearth of deliverance ministers in this country, in this present world. Amen? There's an exciting ministry that's available to you. It's hard, it's true. Uh, you have to be willing to suffer ridicule and rejection. It's a hard ministry. But brethren, it's a ministry that brings eternal reward. You know, as I sat there last night and Brother Charlie testified to the, to the fact that I was able to help him, at one point in his life. When I sat there and heard the sister from Houston testify the fact that I was able to help her at some point in her life, it just filled me with not pride, but joy. Because I can see that I've been able to help people in many parts of the world. Huh? I've been able to help them. But see, unless you come out of that condition you're living in, some are just vegetating, some are just existing. Especially if you're advanced in years, and maybe you're retired, you took early retirement, and now you're just living to, to travel from one water hole to another water hole, uh, fishing or camping. But, but that won't satisfy you. That's a selfish life. You're just looking for quietness and peace and rest. Well, then how can you do that when there's a, a big job to be done? Uh, there's a battle to be won. There's a world to be conquered. Uh, come out of that condition you're living in. God wants to bring you out, but you have to cry out and cry out loud. It, your prayers have to be be born in the depths of your soul. You have to back your prayers with uh, anguish and with uh, affliction so that God will hear you and God will help you and God will intervene in your life so that you can become a blessing to the world. Amen? Now let's look at the second theme. This is a four-part play. It's a deliverance play. Amen? We can see it, God at work in different ways and different people. But the gist of the matter is that God was intervening 
miraculously in the life of every one of these men, according to their condition and according to their need. Number two, starts in verse 10, and we'll read from verse 10 down to verse 16. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought them down, or brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and break their bands in thunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass, and cut the bars of iron in thunder. Now here we have another picture of another man. This man was locked up in a prison house. He was sitting in the death row. The Bible says he was sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. That means that he was condemned to death. Uh, he was going to be, uh, become, uh, he was going to have to uh, go through uh, what capital punishment. Was it going to be the craft or the gallows or the electric chair or the guillotine? We don't know. But this man was sitting in the shadow of death. Why? Because he had rebelled against God and against society. He had rebelled against all the laws that God has established for man's protection. See, the cause of most of our trouble and most of our misery in life is what? Rebellion. I think what rebellion is one of the main causes of demonization. Rebellion has many different ways. Uh, it expresses itself or it manifests itself. Huh? When you're stubborn, that's rebellion. Huh? When you're capricious, that's rebellion. When you're disobedient, that's rebellion. When you're haughty, that's rebellion. Behind all these things, there's a spirit of rebellion. You're trying to assert yourself. You're trying to do your own thing. You're trying to get away with whatever you choose to get away with. You don't want to recognize, obey authority of any kind. You want to live according to your own whims and wishes. That's rebellion. Our rebellion will get you in the heap of trouble. It always does. Uh, there in the book of Proverbs it says that the rebel seeketh nothing but what? Evil, harm. And an evil angel, a cruel angel, will be sent against him. See, rebellion always produces judgment. God always will judge rebellion. Because to him rebellion is just as serious as witchcraft, is just as serious divination, it's just as serious as any of these occult practices. Amen? Boy, it's getting quiet here this morning. Now notice, the Bible says that this man was in, locked up in a prison house. He was in jail. He was in a dank, dark cell. He was right down in, in, in death row, just waiting for his execution. Why? Because he had rebelled. Now notice verse 13, what it says. Then they cried. See, God it sometimes has to bring us right to the end of ourselves. He has to bring us to a place where we know that we cannot help ourselves in any way. We've lost our personal freedom. We have, we have, we have lost the right to even make our own decisions. We're under control or we're under domination of other people, of other forces. Then we remember that there's a God up in heaven. And we cry. And notice what the Bible says here. Then they cried unto the Lord in trouble, and he saved them or delivered them out of their distresses. Brethren, this is a condition of many Christians today. They're, they're in a prison house. It's not a, a physical prison house. It's a spiritual prison house. How many Christians are bound up by evil spirits? Huh? They, they constructed their own prison house. And all day they walk around, they, they work and they play, yet their spirit is in a prison house. There's bars, and there's locks, and there's chains. They're all bound up by evil spirits. And this is the fruit of rebellion. I'm not here today to give you a Bible study of rebellion, although it's one of the subjects that I deal with the most. Because, brethren, it's the spirit of the age. Rebellion on a mass scale is called anarchy. When everyone does what is pleasing and what is good in his own eyes. And that is the spirit that has been uh, spread throughout America. We're living in a permissive society. We're living in a promiscuous society. We're living in a society where everything goes as long, they say, as it doesn't hurt anybody. Well, I'll tell you, rebellion will hurt you and your children. 
relatives, friends, and neighbors will hurt everybody. Uh, because rebellion is disregarding and disobeying God's law that had been established not to harm us, but to protect us from sure death. Yes. Amen? A man here is sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. I wonder how many of us here this morning might be in this condition. Bound up. Uh, God wants to break our bands asunder. Yeah, he wants to destroy those invisible chains, those habits, uh, those, uh, those influences upon our lives. But when will he do it? When we take the first step. When, when we cry out, when we, we, we will cry out when we discover finally that there's nothing we can do to help ourselves. Yes. As long as we think we can help ourselves, we won't recur to God. We'll go on trying this and trying that till we fall flat on our faces. And we say, Lord, I give up. I realize that I'm too far gone. There's nothing that I can do to save myself from sure destruction unless you intervene. See, when the person has been condemned to death and maybe an execution is going to take place within a few hours, what does that criminal do? He appeals for what? For mercy. He makes a plea for mercy. Uh, an appeal is made before the governor or before the president for mercy. That's, that's, the, the, that's the only thing that is left. Because all the legal procedures have been, have been used to try to get that person released from death. And brethren, in, uh, in one of the things that's absolutely indispensable if we're going to be delivered is that we appeal to God's mercy. I have a message that I call Fiery Serpents. I haven't preached it here at Lake Hamilton. I think I preached in Beaumont or El Paso or Los Angeles. I don't know. Last year I preached it somewhere. And it talks about demonization by divine judgment. I believe most cases of people that come under demonic influences by divine judgment. It's punishment, it's correction, it's discipline. God is judging his people by permitting evil spirits to invade their lives. In fact, God sends evil spirits. How many have discovered that? Huh? Well, many Christians are shocked when, when I tell them that demons are not sent by Satan, they're sent by God. Demons are under God's direction, under God's control. And God sticks them on us. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're God's uh, whipping boys that come to... Uh, to uh, punish us for our misdeeds. Amen? And the only way we're going to be delivered, if that be the case, is by appealing to God's mercy. Have you studied many of the miracles that Jesus performed in the gospel? Uh, miracle healing, deliverance, restoration? Nearly every man that came to Jesus, man or woman that came to Jesus, appealed to God's mercy. Bartimaeus, the blind man, the beggar, when he cried out to Jesus, he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The Syrophoenician, when she cried out to Jesus for help and for, for deliverance for her uh, demonized daughter, she said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy. See, mercy triumphs over judgment. The only thing that will cancel out judgment is mercy. Amen? We have to learn to appeal to God's mercy. And the way we appeal to God's mercy is by repenting. By repenting. That's where this man was under divine judgment. He was locked up. He was bound and afflicted. He was in, in the gallows. I mean, he was in death row. He was ready to be ex executed. He was ready to be destroyed. And he had to cry out for mercy. He cried out unto the Lord in his distress, and the Lord delivered him. Amen? Is there a solution to your problem? Is there a solution to your need? Can you be delivered? Yes. But what are you going to have to do? Cry out. And cry out for what? For mercy. Mercy will cancel out that judgment that's pending upon you and probably all, uh, upon your family lineage. Amen? Mercy. And we need to learn to appeal to God's mercy. God's mercy is for everlasting. God, one of his traits, one of his virtues is mercy. He wants to be merciful. But he cannot be merciful until we cry out to him. Amen? Now we've had two things already. A man that is lost where? In the wilderness, wandering aimlessly, lost, and completely dissatisfied. He had nothing to drink, nothing to eat. He was in danger of death. Uh, from uh, from uh, sunstroke and from starvation. But when he cried out, God brought him out of that condition. He led him, he directed him to a safe haven. 
he was delivered. Amen? Now the second scene is of a man that's locked up in jail. Uh, he's there in, in, what, in a dank cell, dark cell. And I tell you, prisons today are ghastly places. I don't know if any of you have been there on a visit or been there on a jail term, but they're ghastly places. But today, they are luxury hotels in comparison to what they are in other countries of the world or in other ages of history. Um, they were terrible places. And this man was just waiting for death. Death was pending. The execution was at hand. And he cried out and God delivered him. Now the third scene begins in verse 17 and down to verse 22. Fool, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them praise the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Now here we have another scene of another man. This man is sick in body. That's why the Bible says he sent his word and healed them and delivered him. He was sick, but it was not just any ordinary kind of disease. It was an incurable disease. It was a deadly disease. This man was in bed, afflicted, body, soul, spirit, by this dreaded disease. The Bible says that he abhorred all manner of meat. He stopped what? Eating. And we have a saying in Spanish that as long as the patient eats, there's hope for him. Uh, as long as he eats, he'll survive. But once a, a patient stops eating, then he will go down and down till he withers and dies. Death is inevitable when somebody stops feeding. Now, today they have intravenous feeding, but back then they didn't have such a thing. <laughs> today they'll, they'll feed you through the vein. They'll force food into you. Back, back then, the only thing they could do is, when a person stopped eating, is uh, to wait for what surely would come, death. Now, this man was sick. And why? Well, the verse we have just read, verse 17, gives the reason, it gives the cause. Fool. <laughs> Fool because of the transgression. The word transgression is the same word as rebellion in many places of the Bible. Fool because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Brethren, let me say something to you today, and I, I'm talking out of personal experience. When you transgress, when you rebel against God's clear commandments, you are a fool. The most foolish thing you can do in life is rebel against God and God's delegated authority. You're always going to pay for it. And the consequences can be frightful. See, much sickness comes from rebellion. You see, we need to know God's laws. I'm not a legalist. I don't think we need, we must go back under the Old Testament law. But there's a lot of dietary laws. There's a lot of sanitary laws. There's a lot of laws in the Old Testament that we would do well to be for our own well-being and for our own protection. God didn't give these laws uh, just for a particular race of people at a particular time in history. These laws were given to his people so his people could be spared of certain dangers that would come their way unless they followed these clear-cut instructions from the Word of God. The Bible says here that fools transgress. And brethren, when we transgress, willingly, deliberately transgress God's laws, we are setting ourselves up for a, a strong dose of disease. Amen? So much illness, so much infirmity today is the result of breaking some of the laws that God has plainly left for us to help us and to protect us from what's going on around the world. Amen? Okay, now here we find the third case of a man that was sick. And he needed what? Deliverance. The man that was lost needed deliverance. The man that was bound needed deliverance. The man who was sick needed deliverance. Brothers, most people in the world today, most people in the church today need deliverance. In fact, I tell our people in Latin America that everybody that comes to Jesus for salvation should also go through deliverance. You mean all Christians are demon possessed? Well, <laughs> not possessed, but they're infected or infested by evil spirits. They need to be cleaned out. These demons, they need to get rid of them so that they can return to normal, see, that, so that they can recover that condition, that primeval condition uh, that man had before he transgressed and before he fell. 
You know, that's the purpose of Christ's redemptive work, is to bring us back into a full relationship with God, uh, where all the effects of the fall are dealt with. Amen? Everything that came into the human race through Adam's transgression should be canceled out, should be annulled through Christ's redemptive work on the cross of Calvary. Amen? But we need to apply redemption. That's what this psalm is all about. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, those that he has redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. That's, deliverance is part of redemption. It's an important part of the redemptive process. And we need to experience deliverance if we are lost, if we are sick, if we are bound, if we are afflicted. We need to be submit to deliverance. I don't think any Christian anywhere should resist the message of deliverance. In fact, sometimes the people that resist it the most need it the most. Mm -hmm. That resistance you feel inside of you is demonic, because Satan knows that the moment you open yourself up and you accept the message, you believe the message, that that moment you're going to be free. And he'll do everything in his power to dissuade you, to deceive you into thinking that you don't need deliverance, that you're an exceptional person. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. Okay? Somebody can bless the Lord. Now, you can see here one of the means that God uses to deliver his people, whether they're wandering aimlessly, whether they're locked up in a jailhouse, whether they are, whether they are bedridden because of some incurable disease. What is it? He sent his word. The proper use of the word of God is, is the way to deliver it. As the word is applied, huh? as the word is implemented, brethren, the word has an, in, well, I would say, indispensable place in the deliverance ministry. Uh, deliverance workers should be word people. You know, we hear so much about word, word. Uh, the, the, there's been an emphasis in certain segment of the body of Christ on the word, the word of life, the word of faith, the word of this, the word of that. <laughs> but the strange thing is that the word people many times don't believe in deliverance. And, and deliverance is coupled with the word. Uh, there can be no deliverance unless the word of God is believed and is applied. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them. That was the tool. That was the weapon. See, the Bible says, Ye shall know the truth, thy word is true. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And you need to know the truth about yourself. And you need to know the truth about Satan and his demons. And you need to know the truth about Christ and his redemptive work. And you need to know the truth about the Holy Spirit. And you need to know the truth about the angelic ministry. You need to know all these various truths can, that can only be found where? In the Bible. And if you believe them and apply them and implement them, that word will set you free from that demonic condition that you've lived in for so many years. Okay, now let's go to the fourth picture. Found from verse 23 through verse 31. They that go down to the sea in ships, and do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth, and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro, and stagger like a drunken man, in, and are at the wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in the troubles, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He makes the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them out, or bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Now here's another man that is tossed in a storm. This is a, a storm like few of us have ever seen. I remember when I was a boy, uh, during the Second World War, our family was going back to the mission field after a year's fur furlough. We sailed out of New York City. Uh, for Havana, Cuba, for Veracruz, Mexico, for uh, Limon, Costa Rica, and finally for Barranquilla, Colombia. And we got lost in one of those tropical storms, what would you call it, hurricanes, in the, in the Caribbean. I mean, since it was during the World War, the, the boat was uh, had no communication. There were Nazi submarines in the, in the Caribbean, and so they couldn't radio. And in fact, we had to travel without any kind of light because the boat could be spotted and the boat could be torpedoed. And for 14 days we were lost in the Caribbean. And everybody in that ship, including the captain and all the sailors, were sick, but ghastly sick. The dining room was empty. 
People, people just didn't go for breakfast or lunch or supper. And everybody was uh, uh, retching and uh, vomiting because they, 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 the storm was... I, I've never, never before, never after have I ever been in a storm just like that one. Uh, the Lord had mercy on us and we were able finally to get to our destination what was uh, Barranquilla, Colombia. That's where we were living and ministering at the time. But brethren, th this can be a frightful thing, thing because it says the winds lift you up to heaven and then toss you down where? To the depth. Waves that cover the boat and, and flood the boat. It's something undescribable. Now the Bible says here in this passage that God commanded. Just read, notice the word. Verse 25, for he commanded and raised the stormy sea, stormy wind. Let me, let me say something, brethren, this morning. Many of our circumstances, even the most adverse circumstances, even the most unpleasant circumstances in our life are ordained of God. The word wind there, the stormy wind, the word wind is the same word that you can find in the Bible for spirit. He commanded the spirit. He Many, many storms, if you read them and study them in the Bible, were caused by evil spirits. Remember when Jesus was traveling across the Sea of Galilee and a tremendous storm broke out and the disciples, they were, they were navigators, they were fishermen, they had been raised around the Sea of Galilee and they were frightened to death. They began to row and, uh, and to cry. Uh, Jesus was pleasantly asleep. He wasn't worried. He knew who was in control of the situation. Uh, he rested, he slept, while the others were frantic. Well, finally, they, 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 they lost hope, so they went over and shook Jesus awake. And they said, Lord, don't you care? Aren't you concerned about us? And he didn't say a word. He just got up and began to rebuke the winds and the waves. Why, well, the word says he rebuked. It's the same word that can be found when he rebuked evil spirits and human beings. He discerned that behind the storm there were what? Spirit forces. Okay? And God can permit, and sometimes ordain, storms in our lives. How many of you have felt that sometimes you're in a violent storm? Everything is helter-skelter. You're living in the midst of a, of a hurricane. Everything is in disarray. Your life is, is being tossed to and fro. You don't, you don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. Your life is a storm. Who's behind this storm? Satan. It's true. But with divine permission or divine ordination. See, sometimes God permits the storms because the storms will drive us to our knees. The storms will make us seek his faith. The storms will make us plea and cry for mercy. And this is the condition of this man. Uh, he, was, he was troubled. He was distressed. The Bible says their soul is melted because of the trouble. How many of you felt that happen? Uh, your soul just becomes so downcast because of the unpleasant circumstances of life. You've lost your health, you've lost your business, you've lost your courage, you've lost everything that you have depended on for so long. Oh, but brethren, there's an answer. And the Bible says here that they, when they were at wit's ends, then they cried unto the Lord. And sometimes we've got to be brought to that place where we're at which end we don't know what to do. Now, the situation is so hopeless and so helpless that we don't know what to do. We've ran out of solutions. We appealed to different people. We've sought for counsel. We've sought for advice. We've gotten advice from our ministers and from business partners and from this man and that man. Some people of our confidence, people that we, we look up to. And when we're at which end, then we cry out unto the Lord. Amen. And he will bring us out. That's deliverance. He will bring us out. Notice the result of, of deliverance in this case. Verse 29. He maketh the storm a calm. Calm. Verse 29. So that the waves thereof are still. Then they are glad because they be quiet. Calmness. Stillness. Quiet. Peace. Tranquility. See, we can be in the midst of a situation like this. The storm might be blowing and brewing around us. And yet we can be calm. The peace of God can govern, can rule, supreme in our hearts. But when we lose our calm, when we lose our peace, that means that we're under demonic attack. Amen? And we need to appeal to God. We need to cry out, and the sooner the better, we need to cry out for help so that God can intervene and God can deliver us from that 
situation that could destroy us unless God did something in our behalf. You know, I've always said, and I've said it here in Lake Campbell, and I said it again, I don't think there's any place in the life of true Christians for any kind of drugs. We don't need sedation of any kind. We don't need tranquilizers. And if you've got some, just throw them out. <laughs> because, brethren, the, the, we need not that false peace. We don't need any kind of counterfeit that comes from chemical products. That will befuddle our mind and keep us, our mind so, how will we say, in a daze, so heavy, huh, that we're not able to cope with life. The Lord's willing to give us quietness and willing to give us peace. That's one of the direct results of deliverance. If you've gone through deliverance and you still don't have peace, it's because there's something still hindering that peace that God gives freely and abundantly to those that seek him with all their heart. Now let's look at these four pictures again. First, the story of a man that was lost in, in a dry and waste place. He was lost in the wilderness. He had lost his sense of direction. He had lost his bearing. He didn't know where he was going. He couldn't find uh, his destination. He just wondered and wondered and wondered. He was exposed. He was in danger of being stricken by the sun. He was in danger of dying out of hunger and thirst. He was in danger of dying from starvation. And he cried out, and God delivered him out of the hand of the enemy. Amen? Is that your condition? Is that what you've been going through? Have you been in this kind of wilderness for several months or several years? You've lost your, your bearings. You don't, you don't know what you're living for. You're just existing. You're just drifting through life. You need deliverance. Amen? And God is willing and ready to deliver you, but he's he, he, he set down a condition. Did you notice that in every one of these cases, it says they cried out, they cried out, they cried out. That's what we have to do. Amen. When we cry out and we cry out loudly, God will hear and God will answer. His ear is not deafened that he cannot hear. But huh? well, we need to cry out. Because when we cry out, we demonstrate the fact that we realize that we're hopeless unless God does something in our behalf. This man would have been a carcass. His bones would have breached there in the sun in that wilderness unless he had a cried out. The second condition is a man, of a, a man locked up in jail. He's in a dank cell, a dark cell. He's in a dungeon. He's waiting for execution. He's been condemned to death. And the sin that hasn't been, ex uh, hasn't been carried out yet. He's in death row. In the shadow of death. Why? Rebellion. And this is the cause of most of our problems in our Christian life, rebellion. We can't disregard God's law. We can't despise God's law without suffering the consequences. Well, we do as well to go through the Old Testament, the New Testament, and find out what law God has laid down for our protection. Even those that have to do with uh, sleep and eat and everything else. Because if we contemn, and that means the word contempt is to scorn, scoff, contempt. That means to despise God's law. This is what happened to David. You know, David fell into one a dreadful sin. And what was that sin? Murder? Adultery and then murder. And he thought he'd covered up his 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 deed. So let's go to first Sam second Samuel chapter twelve. Second Samuel chapter twelve. What was the cause? Why did he fall into this sin that brought so much reproach and brought so much suffering upon himself? Through the book of Psalms, David confesses not only to his sin, but as to his illness. He describes his illness in detail. And many people think that as a result of this wrongful relationship that David had with Bathsheba, he had acquired some kind of illness. Could have been a venereal disease. I mean, he just wrought it in life. Yeah, you can, he talks about all his sores and all his pains. God, God judged the sin. God punished him for his sin. But no, no, what, the, the basic reason why David fell into this sin can be found in 2 Samuel 12, 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Why? Why did David sin? Because he what? He despised the word of the Lord. He ignored it. He despised it. He knew God's word, but he disregarded it. And that's what happens to many of us. 
We know God's word as it pertains to many, many things in life, physical and moral and spiritual. And yet, brethren, we will deliberately ignore God's plain instructions and warnings. We'll despise the word of God. And that's why we fall into bondage. And many times that bondage can be so intense that we are at death bed. Huh? We're just waiting for death. But even there, the Lord's willing to intervene, isn't he? Yeah. How many have read Psalm 103? Yeah. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and bless. For what? For all his wonderful works. Now, with, he, he, is, he is it, or I don't know how I'm translating from Spanish, that forgiveth all thine iniquities, that healeth all thy diseases, and then what? Redeemeth thy life from where? Destruction. From destruction, right? From the edge of the grave. God's willing to redeem us. Snatch us back from the claws of death. If we are willing to cry out to him for mercy. Amen. The third scene is a man sick. Afflicted in body and mind. He's in bed. He has no movement. He can't, he can't rise up. He no longer can dress himself or feed himself or help himself. He, he abhors his food. He can't eat it. He can't, he's lost the, the desire to eat. But when he cried out, God intervened. And what did he use to intervene in this man's life? His word. word. He sent his word. And brethren, we need to discover the power of the word of God. Uh, Remember when Jesus was coming into a town there in Israel, and a centurion came out and said, My servant, my young servant is at home, paralyzed from head to toe, grievously vexed. That word, grievously vexed, reveals that this type of paralysis was caused by demon influence. The devil was vexing him, tormenting him, harassing him. This boy was, was in bed, suffering great pain and affliction. Jesus said, I will go and heal him. And he said, Lord, it's not necessary. Don't trouble yourself. I'm not worthy that you darken the door of my house. Why, the only thing you have to do is speak the word. And my, and my servant will be healed. And God's word can travel over great distances. There's no barriers to God's word. There's no distances to God's word. God's word is spirit and life. It has a tremendous penetrating force. He said his word. And the boy was delivered and healed and restored on the spot. This is what God's willing to do us, do for us, if we will just cry out for mercy. And the fourth thing, and I'm just reviewing, is a man that was tossed in a storm. And the Bible says that was a great storm. God had commanded the winds. The winds had whipped up the sea. The, the, the boat in which this man was traveling was just ready to sink. Uh, the waves were of such huge proportion that the boat was lifted up to heaven and then down to the depths. Even the most seasoned sailors were at the, at the wit's end. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. But they cried out to God and God intervened. Let me tell you, brethren, this morning that deliverance is an act of divine intervention in our behalf. If we're lost, God wants to deliver us. If we're bound, God wants to deliver us. If we're ill, God wants to deliver us. If we're tormented by the storms of life, God wants to deliver us. Uh, God wants to redeem us out of the hand of the enemy. And I believe that's why the Spirit of God has brought you to this place. You didn't just come here for a vacation. You didn't come here just for a few days of rest and relaxation. You came here with a definite purpose, and that is deliverance. Amen? God wants to give your life a sense of direction. God wants to give you freedom. God wants to give you health. God wants to give you peace. Peace. God wants to provide everything you want and need to make this life successful. But one of the first steps you have to take is deliverance. Get rid of your fear and your pride. Huh? Don't think you're better than anybody else. Uh, Brother Glenn Miller's had demons, you've got them too. <laughs> Brother Charlie Holtz has had demons, you've got them too. And Brother Norman Parrish has had demons, you've got them too. Don't think you're so uppity that the devil hasn't touched you. Perhaps you've got the worst kind of demons. <laughs> now the demons of pride and arrogance and haughtiness, they're some of the worst to get rid of. Oh, that's right. huh? <laughs> but when you cry out to God for deliverance, God will make your life beautiful by straightening your life out, uh, the course of your life, giving you direction, giving you goals that you can reach, goals that will be a, a blessing to you and to your people. Amen? 
He'll set you free. He'll give you a restoration of health and strength and courage as you've never seen before. Uh, he'll bring you out of that stormy sea and give you quietness and peace. You know, a person that's free is a person that is tranquil, no matter what's going around, happening around about him. He's just, he, he, he's in a place where the storm doesn't affect him or doesn't reach him. Why? Because he's found true freedom in the Spirit of God. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. How many have been redeemed? How many have been delivered? Hallelujah. Don't keep it quiet. Don't hide it. Don't ignore it. Don't deny it. Uh, they're in your prayer groups. They're in your churches. Tell people that God is uh, in the delivering business. Uh, and don't be afraid to go into detail and even to mention the demons that came out of you. Uh, why? Because that can encourage others that are in, sa in the same or worse straits than you are in, or that you were in. <laughs> Let the redeemed of the Lord say, that's confession, that's witnessing, that's testimony. God wants you to tell the true story of your deliverance, because then others will take courage, and others will rise up and claim their deliverance through the mighty power of the Spirit of God. It's the devil himself that would try to get you to compromise. Water it down, you know. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to offend anybody. That you're doing more harm by keeping quiet than by telling the the full story. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those that have been redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. This is what God wants you and I to do. This is the song of deliverance. Let's read and let's study it, because brethren, the Lord wants to speak to us. It shows the need for deliverance. It shows the road to deliverance. And it shows that after we've been delivered, we need to praise him. And we need to, to tell others so that others can come into the fullness of freedom through Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you this morning. I'd like to add a prayer to what Brother Norman has already brought forth. Maybe we can bow our heads for just a moment. As Brother Parrish was speaking, I, I sense in my own life a profound uh, penetration of the Holy Spirit to bring us into the clear reality of the purposes of God in this area. I sense the love of God uh, coming forth as, as Brother was ministering and teaching God's Word, and I saw with a, with a new clarity God's desire uh, to bring us out. I have known this, and I have known this, and I preach this, but this morning I really saw it crystallized. I thank God uh, for Brother Parrish's Word this morning. God wants to set the course of our life. He wants to set the direction of our life. He wants to do this. He wants to see us prosperous. He wants to see us joyful. He wants to see us victorious. God does not want to see us hurting. He does not want to see us shattered and broken and bound. He wants to bring us out. And this is what God penetrated so deeply into my understanding as Brother was preaching. I think maybe we can just pray right now. We can pray individually. We can pray corporately and acknowledge together the reality of what the Brother has brought to us this morning. Just thank the Lord uh, for his, his intervention in our lives. Thank the Lord for his willingness and his desire and, and his efforts uh, towards bringing us into the full and mature person that he'd have us to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not forsaken us by any means. He's with us always. He's working all the time in our lives. We come across a circumstance and a difficulty, and sometimes we feel alone. But oh, if we call upon the name of the Lord, he'll send a preacher, he'll bring a scripture verse, it'll be in a song. There's a constant assurance that Jesus is right there, ready to minister. He's just oh so ready to minister. And this is what I want you to thank the Lord for this morning with me, friends. Just thank God. For his, for his awareness of our lives, the awareness of our needs, he truly is one that sticketh closer uh, than a brother. And we praise the Lord for it. We bless you, Lord, as a congregation of people. We thank you, Lord, as, as those who have been the recipients of the redemption that Brother Parrish spoke about, the, the grace of God, the awareness of the Bible and the ministry of the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the pastor and the teacher and the believers. Oh, God, we're a blessed people this morning. We want to thank you and bless your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. Though we might not have all the answers and solutions, we know the one who has the answers. We've embraced the one who has the solution, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for his ministry this morning. We bless you, Lord, this morning for this word that comes forth from, 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 the, from the Bible, for the reality and the assurance of the presence of God. Thank you, Lord, for undergirding us. Thank you, Lord, for building up our faith. Thank you, Lord, for reinstructing us and, and, and reconvincing us of, of, of your hand in our lives. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We pray, as Brother Parrish has exhorted us, that this deliverance may surely come, because the world is suffering. 
Amen. The creation is groaning even presently under the bondage of the corruption. That we, O oh God, may experience this liberty as a part of the first fruits company. That we may experience the reality for ourselves experientially. And then bring it forth into thy blessed creation. And begin to serve as ministers and servants and sons of God. To undo these awful works of bondage and corruption and even death. Uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make it a personal prayer this morning. And then if you've been suffering in any area that Brother Parrish has spoken about during the course of this meeting, call out upon the name of the Lord right there. You can do it. Let's, let's just, let you and me and, and, and you and God this morning, wherever you're seated, tell God what the need is. Oh, Bartimaeus cried out and he, and he stood amongst the, his peers and he said, Lord, thou son of David, have mercy on me, Lord. And, and Jesus met his need. The, the Syrophoenician woman, that despite the fact that she wasn't even the right nationality, recognized that, oh, if she could just get the master to pray for her daughter, she'd be delivered and set free. Let's press in this morning and, and have faith this morning and believe God this morning. It's not the hand of God that keeps us from pressing into the Lord Jesus. It's the hand of God that brings us. It's the, it's the circumstances, the powers, the walls, the demonic entities that are there keeping us against it. But friends, I have good news for you. We are able, God has made us able to press right in and to take the victory by the power and the authority of the word of the Lord God. You don't need to leave this camp meeting with that condition in the lung or that condition in the sinus or that emotional stress or water, that guilt, that condemnation, that cursing that's come into your life, that awful condition of poverty or the, the loss of finance, the loss of vocation, the loss of a business. God can bring the deliverance and he wants to bring the deliverance uh, for the sake of his glory in the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost. Just pray and make it your prayer this morning. And let's pray also, I feel inclined to pray, that this word of the Lord will go forth unto our loved ones, people that we are, are surrounded by, people in our homes. Oh, it was so glorious to sit and listen as God's word came forth, wasn't it? This is a message we need to get to our people, dear folks who are in bondage, folks that may never have heard this gospel of the kingdom and the purposes of God being brought forth. Mention your loved ones this morning, friends. Mention your, your sons and your daughters before the Lord and, and your husbands, your wives, your, your mom, your dad, aunts and uncles, those that, that you're praying for. You say, oh God, I want to be a blessing this morning in this meeting. I want to be a minister of, of, of reconciliation. I want to bring the power of God, the word of God, the message of God uh, to these specific folks and name them. And I tell you the truth, folks, the Lord will see to it that the message gets to them. Praise the name of the Lord. Do you want this anointing to bring this message? We need to want to ask God for the anointing. It takes the anointing. It takes some, some folks together in one accord praying for the anointing. Oh, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, say the Lord God of hosts. Them. I tell you, dear friends, when the folks come in and they're hurting, they will know. They will know if you have what they need. God will show them. It, it's so clear in the scripture, the hurting folks, the desperate folks, the bound folks, the they, they would come to Jesus and they, they, they would know they could just touch him, just get near him. That there'd be deliverance. We need this anointing and this power in our lives. Hallelujah. Make it a prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory, glory to God. Something else Norman said about the reality of the Christian, the dear believer, the, the, the person that God has redeemed, the being a bondage to the sorcery, to the need to, 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 they can't sleep at night because of sleeping pills. They can't sleep at night. They need to take a pill to get up. Oh, friends, the whole church is praying. Can I ask you this morning, if you're one of these dear folks, and your emotions are that tattered, your, your nerves are that shot, we'd like to pray with you this morning and just minister to you this morning and bring deliverance to you this morning uh, from the necessity of the use of these drugs. Brother Powers was saying how they affect the mind, and sometimes we... We take these things and we begin to lose sense of reality and we, we don't even become the recipients of the blessed moves of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit because of the, of the sedation that our system is under. God works through our system. God works through our, through our minds. He, he speaks through our voice. He moves through our hands. And, and because of these, these horrible things, uh, folks so times never become the, the, the full potential that God wants for them. I'm asking the entire church to pray. I really believe there's, there's deliverance this morning. In the lives of folks who, who, who right now are saying, Brother Parrish, uh, that, that message you brought about that, that need for the pills, I, I need this sedation. I don't want it. I want to come forth in newness of life. I want to be able to live what I'm, what I'm preaching and believing. I want it to be a reality in my life. Um, I want you to slip out of your chair and just make your way to the front of the church building. We want to pray with you this morning and believe God to set you free from some of these addiction things and these slavery things. Um, in the name of the whole church is, is in prayer. 
Faith is alive. The power of God is here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everyone pray with me if you will for these dear folks. Pray in the Spirit. These folks are hurting many times. Hallelujah. Will you come, brother, and help me to pray for these dear folks? We're speaking specifically about, about medication now that, that, that's used in, 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 in mind, changes the mind, it, 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 it binds the mind, it, 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 it darkens the mind, and it, and it brings condemnation all times and all kinds of misery. This is how God is moving this morning. Anyone else, come quickly this morning as we pray and minister the power of God to you. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we stand together this morning as an entire body of believers. Our hearts reach towards this dear lady in Jesus' name, a precious one. Hallelujah. Yapodi. Ingarababosika. Yes, you don't need all those terms of things. Yeah, they're poisonous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've got to remember some of them. Yeah. 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 spoke to me through this dear man and remind me of something else God's servant brought to us this morning. Yeah, there are those spirits, those haughty spirits, proud spirits, anything that you know, my revelation is keeping you from moving on, not only in the things of God with regards to your own ministry, but your own deliverance is being hindered. And this morning, God has spoke to you about dealing with these matters. I'd like to invite you, dear folks, to come as well. These are realities. Sometimes pride will hold us back a haughty spirit, an arrogant spirit. We fight God. Our carnal mind fights God, and God is so willing to bring the reality of deliverance into our lives. If this happens to be you this morning, we invite you to come. We're going to pray and minister to you. And uh, I'll tell you, friends, if you'll come, the remaining time of this camp meeting will be so much more beneficial. If this is your situation, this is your need, uh, don't let anything hold you back this morning. But be a, be a recipient of all of this wonderful, wonderful ministry that the Lord has for us at Lake Hamilton this, this week. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. That the God is moving. If there's some folks that, that, that will pray and minister with us here for a little while with these dear people. If you love God, if you love the people, if you're receptive to the Holy Spirit and you want to see folks' lives touched and blessed, the direction of life, such, just make your way by me here. I, I can't pray for all the folks, but God knows that uh, the needs are here and God's Spirit is here. We're going to pray for everybody we can. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.